shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to a Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher, and with me as always, and let's put a round of applause here or so to our, my good friend Tom, who is celebrating four years as a podcaster. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. That's, I can't believe it's been four years. That's gone by quick. It does. It does go by very quickly. I was thinking that can't be right, but then I think, well, well, no, okay, we're doing this series this year, and we, I remember we, we, you know, we just did our, uh, well, it looked pretty, and before that we did the uh, time travel, yeah. and then before that we were just doing kind of more random stuff. Oh, we had our uh, MSTK on uh, MST3K on Rift and uh, seen on TV. I'm like, holy crap! <laughs> yeah, no, we went, we went three straight years with solid, and our first year was a even little small chunks of things. Cause I remember opening up with um, vehicles that wanted to kill you <laughs> <laughs> like the car and, and, and such. We kind of went on a little thing and that's yeah. that actually kind of how, where um, our themes were born from. So yeah, it's been fun kind of coming up with a, a theme for the entire season and trying to find things to, to fit into it and, or at least, like I said, with this one, I'm not sure if we'll make a, an entire year or not, but you know that's fine. We can do you know six months of one theme and six months of another, or I kind of get a kick out of doing that. It's kind of fun, oh, and yeah, I've yeah. already got thoughts for the next one. <laughs> yes, no, I, I know. You're, I, I am always impressed with your creative juices around this, but I need to take a moment for a second and go. Okay, it's my four years, so I, I, I've been meaning to ask. I think I deserve double what I'm making now for, for this. At <laughs> absolutely. Least, at least. You, yep, absolutely. I will be happy to give you double of what you are making now. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, you, can apply for a homeless shelter. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me know what you've been up to here lately the last couple of weeks. Have you had a chance to do anything fun or watch anything interesting? Uh, on, well, we, we both transitioned between having lots of snow to it getting really warm. So that's been entertaining for the past couple weeks. Uh, on the entertaining front, uh, I have been dipping into a series on Netflix called The Stranger. Um, apparently this gentleman, Harlan Coben, Um, is a writer of books that a ton of them are getting translated into series on Netflix. So no way, I kind of started one that I was like, I'm not sure if I'm into it. And then I saw that there's a whole bunch of them. So I thought I'd go to the first one that I know of. And it's called The Stranger, a favorite of ours as far as actresses, Hannah John Kamen, um, which we know from like Killjoys, and actually she's uh, she's a Marvel character. She's the ghost, um, so she's the stranger in the series, the stranger. And part of her role is she is in based on her upbringing, and you have to watch the series to understand more about that. I don't want to kill anything, um, even though this particular one I believe is from 2018, 2020, 2020. But she is very much against secrets. So she's making it part of her life's mission paired with her uh, her skills in computer work, as there usually is involved in something like this. Um, she's dug up a bunch of dirt on people, and she is basically going around to individuals. Some she's trying to extort for money. She's trying to blackmail. Others, she is just going up to them and going, hey, did you know your wife did this? And, and of course, they'd uh, have some sort of very um, 
weird interaction with her where she would say enough things that would trigger that she might be right and the person that they have trusted all their lives is probably wrong. Um, and then mayhem ensues from there and this becomes this really... Um, it's got a great creepy element. There's a lot of trying to figure out where the mystery is going and all that. But it's also one of those where there's a bunch of different little stories, but they all tie together. Um, but it, it's also one of those that you become thoroughly amused at because by the time you get to the end, you're like, okay, now there's too much going on for this to be real. <laughs> like, there's no way <laughs> that these many tragic things were all happening that nobody happened to notice until one person pulls one little thread. Nice. I'll have to try to check that out. That sounds really No, no, no. Cool. I, it, it is riveting. It, it is one of those things, literally from episode to episode, it left you right in a spot where you're like, okay, I gotta know what happens next. And that, I love those. <laughs> yeah, those are rare too there there's so many i watch so much stuff where i think if it never came back on eh, oh well right every now and again there's that rare occurrence where the end of the the show you're like i i gotta see what happens next even if you don't really fully understand what the hell's going on or you know i don't i don't get it but I need to know more. <laughs> I love those. And, and here's what I love about this. Um, because this guy is obviously a novel writer and apparently writes novels in a fashion that people envision series is about them, but they're contained. So like this series, The Stranger, there was never going to be a second season. There, there, there's no carrying it on. It's tell this story over the course of eight, eight episodes that should contain pretty much the contents of the book. And then you, you, you've you got a nice contained story, well acted, well directed, looks great. Um, nothing complicated. It's all set in an English town and all that. Very, very reasonable. So, but it, it, it's very compelling. And you know, at the end, one, you get the satisfaction of whatever the end was. But you don't, you're not question. Okay, I need to see the next thing. It, no, no, no. You enjoy this and move on to a whole other story if you want to pursue those further. That's very British. It is. When it comes to a lot of British TV, I've, I've seen several series where it's just one or two seasons, and that's it. Yeah. And it's incredibly popular, but they're like, no, that, that was our story. Yeah. We're good. And the few times that they decided to, oh, okay, we can tell more of that story, it's like, mm. Yeah, no, you're you're stretching it. It's not as good. It's well, how many series have we talked about o over our time together doing this and in our life together talking since we were sixteen? Um, have we gone? You know that series may, went too far. It, it 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 hung out so long. It got boring. It got absurd. No, yeah, absolutely. I lost interest. So. Forcing yourself into a situation where you have to remain contained, it's just, it, there's something freeing about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, very much. So, but that's what I do, and I actually, that that got completed within eight episodes. It got completed within three days. Oh, yeah, and that's nice. Just three, what, one-hour episodes, or? Uh, and, and actually, a little more satisfyingly, they're like 40, 45 minutes. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I could definitely see myself yeah, burning see, through that quick. I like that. Yeah, and, and and the way that they situate them too is like each one is left at a at a subtle cliffhanger. I mean, you know, there's more. It does go. Okay, now I need to know what came of that. But it sits content enough that you're like, okay, I can get to the next one when I'm comfortable to get to the next one. I, I don't have to force it. And because they're short enough, they're not too too long they're not even the full hour but they're not a half hour so they're not a, a waste of time but yeah they're just the right amount of goodness it was fun i, I am i am definitely um properly tempted <laughs> on that one well yeah because now i'm tempted to start the next of uh his uh book series on netflix and i'm like will it be as good 
<laughs> yeah. Because there was one a little newer. I, I, I've forgotten the name of it because uh, he has so many of them at this stage. But it was one where uh, what was nice about this one, these people were well enough off, but they were middle class people. You could really kind of picture yourself in this environment. And the one that I had started first, the premise was really weird. And all of these people le- lived in a really upper end lifestyle. And like, I'm going to have a hard time relating with this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. I'll get there. Excellent. Anything else? No, I think that will pretty much do. But what's up with you? What you've been watching? Uh, nothing terribly good, I have to admit. But that does that probably yeah, doesn't surprise you. <laughs> uh, I think um, one of the first things I watched after we recorded was uh, in kind of memory of the uh, passing of uh, Gary Graham, mm-hmm. which was kind of a surprise death. Yeah, no, uh, no. Gary, Gary Graham, probably most well known as a Matt Sykes from Alien Nation. Yep. Uh, more recently in the sci-fi world, he was. Uh, uh, Ambassador Saval, I think, uh, the a Vulcan ambassador on Star Trek Enterprise. Yep. No, loved him on that. Uh, I went and wa- I I was tempted to pull out Alien Nation. I'm sure. But I'm like, I I cannot get myself into another series right now. You know, I I've gone through, I've watched that series numerous times. It's like I I have too many other things that I'm in the middle of. I can't have do it again. Well, yeah, and if you start Alien Nation, that's what you're going to watch until you're done. <laughs> Yo, absolutely. And the fact that I don't have all the TV movies in my possession, and I'll have to try to dig those up in order to watch them as well. So i like, okay, I'm not going to do that. So I went to 1989's Robot Jocks. Yeah. <laughs> from uh, Empire Pictures. It is... Not a good movie. It's cheesy <laughs> as hell. Yeah. But it is one of those really enjoyable watches. Yeah. I yeah, don't even it, know if I've seen that one. Oh, I have to think you've watched it at some point. I'm sure you and I have watched it together at but, some point. Yeah, it's very, especially being a 1989 movie, probably. The stop motion animation is 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 fine. Yeah. You know, for for the time and everything, it's good. Uh, this was apparently a film that was pretty much responsible for bankrupting Empire Pictures because <laughs> it costs so much to, bu- to to make. The thing about that film to watch is the universe they build without a lot of exposition or anything. It's just you just notice things and just certain lines are dropped here and there that give you a hint of the world in which this thing lives. And that's kind of really fascinating. No, that that's actually pretty cool. And yeah, and I pulled this up while you've been talking, and yeah, it does look familiar. But I probably haven't seen it since the early nineties. <laughs> it, it's worth a watch. You won't walk away going, "Oh, I'm sorry, I wasted an hour and a half on that." No, <laughs> it's it's not one of those films. You'll you'll shake your head and you'll roll your eyes at a few bits and everything, but you'll still walk away going, "Oh, that was fun." Oh, and as I've got it up on IMDb, now on Blu-ray. <laughs> I think it's available on Prime. Is if you want to watch it, yeah. Oh, yes. No, actually, it is showing me that here at the at the lower part of the screen. I, I might have to watch that one. Oh, not to mention just seeing some, uh, refreshing my memory with some of the imagery of the the robot and how they make them move. Uh, I'm getting Pacific Rim vibes here. Oh, Pacific Rim has a lot of robot jocks to thank. Yeah. For. <laughs> I have no doubt. Yeah, wa- watching it move around, seeing how they even control the thing. It very similar kind of experience. So, so yeah, they had to have pulled some stuff from this. Real quick, I watched van helsing from 2004 yeah which i have never i had never watched before oh really no and that was terrible yes <laughs> that is another film that you know the steampunk elements really cool uh-huh. you know the actual idea and the setting great the way over the top and so incredibly fake accents everyone was throwing out oh my god it was Ooh, bad. <laughs> hey, but it has Kate Beckinsale in leather, so... I'll, I'll watch Underworld, thanks. 
that's probably the better way to go. <laughs> Actually, I even found, uh, like, I thought their kind of take on the look of their Frankenstein monster. I liked that. I did like his appearance. I did. I, I love the look, but unfortunately wasted in that particular film. Especially when it was when he was in the practical makeup. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, he looked great. There was a, a few times where he was obviously rotoscope CGI kind of thing going on or whatever. And that I, I didn't quite match the practical makeup, but the actual makeup looked great. And yeah, his it was a very unique take on the creature, and I did really like it. Yeah, no, that, that part was fun and made some of it bearable, but most of it just junk. <laughs> One last thing I'll bring up, only because it kind of has a Star Trek uh, connection. Mm -hmm. There was a 2012 horror film that's kind of a horror, sort of a time loop element called Mine Games. M-I-N-E Games. Okay. Can't say I'm familiar with that one. It tries to do a time loop thing that I, for the life of me, cannot figure out that it works at all. <laughs> And it's really frustrating because there's moments where they kind of things happen and you don't know why they happen. And then towards the end, as you after you realize that they're in some sort of time thing, you start going, oh, that's how it happened. But then you go, but wait. <laughs> but the Star Trek connection is one of the actors is Ethan Peck. Oh, yeah. Spock. Who plays Spock in Strange New Worlds. And he's at times, very Spock-like. <laughs> Even the way he stands. He sta there was one scene where he's standing with his hands clasped behind his back. And I'm thinking, <laughs> was this what they showed? <laughs> <laughs> Part of his audition tape. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, that was kind of funny. Uh, I enjoy that. Apparently, uh, his very uh, unique name in that movie was Guy. Yeah, he he was he was guy. Yeah, put a lot of thought into that. It's not a great film because it makes no damn sense to me whatsoever. I I was inspired to watch it because uh, former co-host Matt and his co-host on uh, their good movie bad movie, they just did Groundhog Day. Oh, well, wonderful! Is their good movie? Yeah, and so they decided to do a bad time loop movie and they dug this up <laughs> so i'm like okay i'll i'll, I'll check this thing out Whew, yeah i can't <laughs> wait to hear what they have to say about it <laughs> it didn't click that they were going to be reviewing it they announced it and then like 10 days later i finally got around to like it actually clicked oh that's what you're going to be watching next and then i watched it like you already recorded didn't you and they're like, yeah, but send a letter. We'll read it next time. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had to hammer some thoughts out. I would imagine. So, yeah, that'll that's 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 it though for me. Uh, yeah, I wish I've watched something of really good quality. I just <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> You'll have to find a palate cleanser. <laughs> Yeah, I did watch Ghostbusters again. That's always a good palette. It's, it had actually been a while since I watched it, so I I thought it was it was time. So that that was kind of my my palette cleanser for the uh, the off week. Interestingly enough, uh, and I'm gonna dovetail off of this. A friend shared uh, what was supposed to be basically the worst characters from movies in the '80s, and actually they had the Ghostbusters on there. Uh, but their reasoning for them being some of the worst characters had to do everything with the fact that, yes, they basically, uh, a bunch of guys came up with an idea, but were basically carrying around technology that could have offed the entire city at any given time with, with essentially a bomb strapped to their back, <laughs> that they made the EPA guy the bad guy <laughs> in all of this when... He's the one actually trying to save the world from them. And, and then the one that really, the stance that really went sideways for me, though, is their treatment of um, spirits. The, the, the notion that uh, 
the spirits that they were catching, um, they themselves were acting as God and uh, imp- choosing to imprison them, regardless of whatever their circumstance or why they're here were. That's true. They did kind of paint them all as being the bad guys, even though we, you know, we never really, other than being mischievous, we didn't see any of them doing anything actually bad. Unless they were being destructive in some fashion, which usually was where you caught in the montages that uh, they were capturing stuff that were killing crystal <laughs> stuff, like uh, crystal in a store or something like that. Or at least that was one of the ones that went off in like the second Ghostbusters. But yeah, I, I just I was real. I, I I was fascinated at the prospect that you were worried about. <laughs> ghosts <laughs> and their 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 well-being i'm like this is all fiction you know that right <laughs> well i don't care you could write theses after theses on this sort of thing ghostbusters is the world's only perfect movie so. <laughs> uh i i i, I it's up there, definitely. It's it's perfect, even in its imperfections. <laughs> uh, it, it is it is one of those that it's just there's no way not to like it. It's just fun all the way around. It is my favorite film. Yeah, it, it, I I don't even stop to take a breath or have to think. When someone says, "Well, what's your favorite movie?" Ghostbusters. <laughs> right? The sentence doesn't even finish coming out of their mouth. It's Ghostbusters. It's always Ghostbusters. Well, what about it's Ghostbusters? <laughs> Well, at least you know what you like. <laughs> well, speaking about imperfect things, let's go ahead and <laughs> jump into our main topic. We'll take a break real quick, listen to a promo for another podcast, and then we will talk about 1996's film Sci Fighters. <laughs> And the worst of the worst And the one where all the characters curse Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, IMDb, and Letterboxd All want to stick a simple rating on what we watch But where's the nuance in that? A popular movie doesn't always age well And who cares if the critics didn't like it? We here at Good Movie, Bad Movie Believe every film has an audience So join us for the good, the bad, and the so bad it's good Such as The Godfather Back to the Future Gigli Jaws Young Frankenstein. Manos, the hands of fate. Killer clowns from outer space. And Plan 9 from outer space. New episodes every other Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Instagram at goodmoviebadmoviepod or write to us at goodmoviebadmoviepod at gmail.com. Or join us on our Discord server by searching Good Movie Bad Movie. The cream of the crop and the box office flops. She's contracted an unknown virus. Unknown? We don't know its nature, how it's transmitted, or even its ultimate effect. In the not too distant future, the fate of mankind will depend on three things (laughs) the will to live, the skill to survive, and one renegade cop with a black shield. Roddy Piper is Lieutenant Cameron Grayson. I ask, you answer. He's on a special mission to uphold the law in the city of the future. But he's about to come face to face with an old adversary. Is the name Adrian Dunn mean anything to you? He's been in jail. Where? On the moon. Who's come back from the grave to even the score. You're dead. I fired more ammunition into Don than most cops do in an entire career and he's still alive. What the hell am I dealing with? Not hell. Just outer space. And spread a deadly plague that will mean the end of mankind. And the dawn of Earth's takeover by a hostile alien life form. Roddy Piper, the star of 
of John Carpenter's They Live, Jungle Ground, and Back in Action. And the Untouchables' Billy Drago. In the explosive sci-fi thriller, Sci-Fighters. They're your only hope. Sci Fighters was directed by Peter Savatek. Sure. S V A T T E K. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I probably should have just left it off entirely. And stars Roddy Piper, Billy Drago, and Jane Heitmeyer. In 2009, Boston, Black Shield detective Cameron Grayson, played by Piper, stumbles onto a crime committed by the man who was responsible for the murder of his wife ex-cop and friend Adrian Dunn, played by Drago. But that seems impossible, since Adrian Dunn died in a lunar prison several days before. The victim dies in the hospital after having contracting a deadly extraterrestrial virus from Dunn. Grayson gets help from scientist Dr. Kirby Younger, uh, played by Jane Heitmeyer, to help him understand the virus and to try to find a way to stop Dunn before he can infect anyone else. What did you think of this one, Tom? It turns out this is about the second time I've watched this film. I didn't recall that I picked this up at some point somewhere and watched it once before, but it was a, a little familiar to me as I was watching it. So so what did you think? This was a first-time watch for sure for you, yeah? yeah yes, first-time watch, last-time watch, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, your synopsis and the way you read it was Far more exciting than anything that I watched during that hour and a half. Really? That bad for you, huh? Uh, I, I found it rather brutal, yeah, a little bit. Uh, um, oh, okay. Because um, Billy Drago was the height of the film. I'm just going to start with that. Like, uh, anyway. He is the quintessential kind of creepy bad guy, isn't he? Yeah. Well, and One I, of them. I, I kept having Briscoe County Jr. flashbacks while I was watching him on screen. And, and one of the things in the movie that I was fascinated by, um, which we'll get into when we talk tech, uh, but like they're taking a statement from a girl that saw saw him and they're having facial features scroll by and in the end they have the composite picture but it's the composite picture of what his face looks like closer to the end of the movie than at the <laughs> point in which she would have actually seen him <laughs> yeah they kind of goofed that one up a little bit a little bit yeah so so the fact that it, He's dying from the, or it's not even clear that he's dying. He just seems to be a carrier at this stage because he already died. Um, so now he's back to life. He's carrying this thing. We do not know. Uh, we don't know where it comes from, why we care, why no one else seems to know about this since there was a guy that had it on the moon in the moon prison. So you would have thought this might have gotten around there before it got down to Earth. But either way, so while he's devolving everybody else around him, it, I, I, I was rooting for him to kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Roddy Harsh. Piper, uh, I, I, th this film is all over the map from the perspective of they make him to be that he's kind of this loner, hardcore detective guy, but then he's all soft and squishy some of the time. And even when he's soft and squishy, he has no chemistry with Jane. But it's I could, oh god, it's just so much because it launches into a Hallmark movie style romance where he's kind of lecherous and she's kind of put off by him. But then all of a sudden, they seem deeply in love in the next day and a half that they're together. <laughs> it is definitely a movie romance. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a romance that can that can only happen in an hour and thirty minutes or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but and I realize I was just very chaotic in my description of what I wanted to talk about about this movie, and in doing that, that's how I felt while I was watching the movie. <laughs> I liked it, but with like caveats. Yes, <laughs> I actually. Don't didn't mind watching this film. I don't think it's quite as awful as as you seem to think it is. Is is it hit you? I yeah. I didn't mind it as much, and a good portion of my enjoyment of it 
really is down to Roddy Piper. Really? I kind of just like him as an actor. Okay. I mean, he only did maybe, what, a, a dozen films or sure. something like that. I've, this is probably only the second one I've seen. I haven't seen a lot of his other films. I may try to like correct that and see some watch some of the others because I think just as an actor and as being even when he is being kind of creepy and you know not necessarily a great guy he's just still to me sort of likable. He he feels like somebody that you kind of you want him to be your friend. Oh, I totally get that. And I'm not going to lay all of uh, the faults at his feet. Uh, clearly, there was some terrible writing and terrible directing in all of this, too. <laughs> but that said, because he's in there and either he's being given terrible advice on how to approach every scene or he is bad. I don't have a whole lot to go on otherwise, <laughs> but right. but he it was clear he didn't have a whole lot of chemistry with with any of the other folks. Yeah, I'd probably agree that you know you you don't look at him and uh, Doctor Younger and think, oh yeah, they, this is a couple that's you know match made in heaven or right. anything like that. There there is no true chemistry between them, but the way he delivers his lines, whether it's be- with her or anywhere, I found him to be what I always consider to be sort of a very natural Mm -hmm. actor. Everything comes across just feeling very much, oh, this is a real person and this is how he talks. He doesn't feel like he's putting on an act. Yeah, no, and and I'll concede that. Yeah, no, like, I'm not bothered by Roddy Piper. I'm just bothered by all the content (laughs) that that he's surrounded by. Now, I... Just when I uh, I logged this in on Letterboxd, and I I gave it two and a half out of five stars. Yeah. So I mean that is right there in the middle. It's kind of how I feel. I I did say that it was mostly down to Roddy Piper, and I do really feel like the thing this film lacks the most is its world building. Yes. It does very little to build the world and it makes it very hard to kind of connect with anyone in this world when you don't know why the world is the way that it is. Yeah. And and they make a lot, a lot of references, like first off, just even starting with the, the non-starter of the moon prison. Yeah. Didn't need to be a moon prison. No, it, it really didn't. Other than the fact that this is where he contracts an alien virus. So uh, we could have made up any other reason why that had happened too. I mean, you could have had a, a penal colony on an island that was hit by an asteroid that had yeah. something, some kind of bug. Because that was part of what was lacking too, is okay, he's got an alien parasite disease of some kind. Why? Where? <laughs> well, they suggested that it was maybe a uh, a form of um, a germ warfare, that it would be an alien species that that that's how they would terraform. Oh a yeah, planet. yeah, no, I, I got the terraforming part, but I mean, yeah, but we didn't really go anywhere with that. Like, like if that was an element of that, you would have thought maybe we need to introduce more about that if that's the way that we're saying. Yeah, but I'm glad that it didn't go down the, oh, this is an alien invasion film. No, agreed. So I, in a way, I, I kind of liked, but I I liked that they didn't go down and try to explain this with too much detail, but I think they maybe went too far in that direction where they could have explained it a little, given us some... How did the first guy get the damn virus in the first place? Where did that come from? Apparently the lunar colony, it, I, I take it it's some sort of hard labor uh, uh, mining or something. Yeah. And so maybe it was just, like you were saying, an asteroid. Yeah, or maybe something they buried. unearthed something on the moon, or do you call it unmooned? <laughs> <laughs> but either way, they dug it up. Uh, I, but... but Again, just give a like we got wild leaps of exposition to get to the notion that this might be a terraforming plot by an alien race. Like that was all speculation. And mm-hmm. if that was speculation that we because 
Well, speculation that was partially confirmed toward the end of the movie when Drago was basically saying, you want me to kill you because you don't want to see what's about to happen to the planet. Yes. He, he, he did say that. So we, that was confirmation that this was the direction. And while I don't necessarily need the alien invasion, would have been nice to see a little the impetus to get to where we're at, even if that wasn't the main thread. Yeah, and it would have been nice if we could have got a better idea. Is this virus intelligent? Right. Um, because, okay, so he knows what's going to happen to the earth that you know the whole terraforming thing kind of like you said it sort of confirms that but he's acting still as done he has done's memories he's he's acting towards all the women yeah um thinking that they're uh, the the girlfriend that married uh detective grayson so yeah you're not sure who's really in control <laughs> And the, these are the elements where I get that this was a little off put. It was so confusing. It didn't know what it wanted to be. Half the time it's a love story. Half the time it's an alien invasion. Sometimes it's a prison break. Sometimes it's a murder mystery. And like, and you're not pulling any of them off. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a film of halves, isn't it? It's just. <laughs> It very much is. There's a lot of things they do halfway. <laughs> and then we can use this moment, if you like, to segue into some of the things like uh, uh, clearly shot in the 90s. And I, I am never one to detract from low budget. Low budget is what it is. The fact that you got your art made and people got to see it, kudos to you never going to fight against that. So, but know where you're at when you're talking those kind of budgets. So, costuming. <laughs> Nobody's costumes fit. They were all way bigger than them, and they were all screaming hardcore 80, or 90s. They were definitely 90. Big jackets, big collars, lots of flair. And so, it was like, Okay, you said this is 2009, but you are not even remotely coming to what what you might even think of in 2009. You're not trying. And then anytime you want to try to do something in the future, why does it always, in the 90s, the 80s, 70s, that, that kind of triple decade there, future meant aluminum foil. <laughs> if you needed to tell anyone right away that we were in the future, somebody was wearing a suit made of aluminum foil, and that's what we started the movie with. <laughs> oh, that's right. The uh, the moon guards. <laughs> yeah. They were all in aluminum foil jumpsuits. Yeah, that does age it just a, just a wee just bit. A, just a bit. Yeah, I'm glad, I like what you mentioned about the uh, the size of everyone's outfits. Yeah, they all look like they just, whatever they had on the rack, and they all that was left was like the big and tall. <laughs> <laughs> they just made do. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And I got that they were trying to go for some future looks with like uh, some of the uh, denizens of the darker parts of the... Uh, of Boston, since that's what this was supposed to be. But they kept saying Beirut in something there. Little, little Beirut. Little Beirut, yeah. Well, there's Little Italy, there's, you know, Chinatown, there's apparently a Little Beirut. Did, well, and again, that might have been them trying to project what they thought might be a thing in 2009. It was just not clear how we got there. Yeah, and that's, I think, what I was talking about with... Um, the world that they were building. Yeah, the world building is they they really did um, nothing in that in that to try to give us an idea of what this universe. I mean, what was the world like before this eco eco disaster that put every put the world into the what do they call it eco night? Yeah, they call they were even yeah they kept calling it eco night and they gave the number of days. And and we yeah, were only really like about three months in. Yeah, we were about yeah. three months into this. Um, so you would think the world be handling that a little differently <laughs> than it was. Like everyone was pretty calm. 
despite the fact that they're uh, launching into a second ice age. Right. Or th- perhaps finally coming out, they only briefly mention what caused it. You get it in the sort of uh, exposition of the uh, the body bag cam. Yeah. As Dunn is being transported back to Earth, you hear the shuttle pilots talking, and you, you see all oh, the little the little brown dot, you know, uh, yeah. talking about Earth. It's covered in dust, and they were saying something about um, I think it was a Japanese some sort of volcanic uh, yeah. power experiment or something like that. Yeah, is what caused it, and that um, it'll be another you know three months or something before it starts to lift. Yeah, that's kind of, that's it. That's all we really get. But the world they build, once you get to Earth, you get the feeling that this has been going on for years. Yeah, and and that's what I'm talking about by this calm. This seems all very normal. For something that, by their counter, is only about three months old, no one seems to be panicking at the notion that they can't see the sun anymore. Right. (laughs) Like, they've even already developed systems. Like, that was the thing that I noted. Um, like they had the lights in buildings changing based on the time of day it was in. Right. And I give this film kudos for even thinking to do that, given yeah. how crappy they did it at many other things. But that was great. But I mean, it seems a little premature in your timeline that we would have devised the, uh, not that it's hard to come up with lighting timers, but, but to, the notion that this would have just been implemented just about everywhere and people are already used to it as a thing. Three years in, sure. Three months, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was a little bit more bothered by um, the fact that the, all of society, it felt like a, a 70s post-apocalyptic movie. Yeah. You know, the, everything... There, there were people that looked like they came out of... Um, <laughs> They looked like they were trying to get from uh, one in New York or the other in the Warriors, <laughs> the way they were, they were dressed and some of the, the character choices and stuff. And it's like, so this is what the world was like before the disaster? <laughs> yeah, no, and, and everybody's like a druggie in some sort of weird clothing and all that. If you're not a professional and the line between one versus the other seems like, a chasm and there's no middle right yeah and i mean he's they're going through and they're getting their sushi or whatever it is and they look like they're like on the outskirts of the set of blade runner exactly (laughs) so yeah just how did the world how did this world get to be where it was ecological disaster or not i just there's nothing there there's nothing to hold on to nothing to grab and and you know, what happened to the world that someone would come up with the idea of this uh, black shield? Cops that don't have to follow the rules. Yeah, I, and I was literally about to mention that. Like, they, they introduce the concept, but not why it's a thing. And, and you're just supposed to accept that. And I'm like, okay, you're, you're set in a world, and if you don't give us anything to hang our hat on, it's hard to make this home. <laughs> And it's a and just like the lunar colony doesn't have to be a lunar colony, right. the black shield doesn't have to be a thing either. You could have just as simp- easily had the uh, police chief go, "No, this is your case." Oh, all right. I mean, oh yeah, oh a, a, god, and <laughs> a couple little bits of dialogue or something changed. Uh, and, and and the guy that was playing the police chief. Oh, it was nails on chalkboard anytime he delivered a line. Mm. <laughs> I, I, you felt like there was a teleprompter on Roddy's shoulder, and he kept moving <laughs> around to try to read it. <laughs> it was just, oh my god, get me out of this scene now. <laughs> you want to talk about some of the uh, technology and the you know predictions of the future? Sure, yeah, because they did actually get sort of something right. They've got a few things here and there. They do have their fancy uh, digital audio recorders and handheld communication devices yeah. that were, you know... It's essentially a smartphone. A little bit like a smartphone, maybe a little further back. I was thinking almost it's a, you know, a, a BlackBerry or a, a Nextel kind of technology Two, with a TV screen added. 2009, that's actually the sweet spot for the BlackBerry. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, you could definitely see that where people had Blackberries or Nextels, and they took the next step with those devices. What would they look like? Had something like the iPhone not come around? No, absolutely. Yeah, no. Uh, that fit very nicely into uh, a, a something we got to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the facial recognition scan yes. that they were doing on the on the one victim with us. They're having her watch the screen, and cameras would watch her and read her subliminal reactions. That's actually a really neat idea, and it's probably something that is probably more now than than then. I don't know how advanced that technology was back then, but that is a thing that you can read things that you you. There are tells sure. that a computer could pick up that a person might not. Yeah, I, where we're at is, yes, such things exist and people are working it. No, there isn't a commercial application at this time. Uh, I'm sure once they do, the world will be a very scary place. <laughs> yeah, you think? Yeah, you think just facial recognition is a scary thing? <laughs> well, yeah, like imagine literally camera we already have the cameras everywhere but if there is something on the other end reading for everything about the way you move your body that your muscles move in your face and all that and knowing that those all actually represents things that we are going to do in some fashion even if it's just move in a direction stare at a thing um and then watch in some shopping scenario, your cart filling with the things that it knows that you're interested in because of the way your eyes move around or your facial expressions change as you see things. And that's just the over commercialization application of something like that. I'm sure there are far uglier ones and we'll figure them out. Yeah. I mean, when you think that a, a facial recognition camera could pick something up and, Oh, he saw that camera and, you know, there was something, there was a tell that made him look guilty. I mean, that's my, you really start pushing that minority report yep. kind of uh, level. Yeah, you'll at least be able to do it in time. I don't know that you'll predict so far out that you'll know, <laughs> hey, 12-year-old Kevin over there is going to murder somebody in 30 years. No, maybe not that, but, you know, what's to say, oh, the camera says that you were you you were being suspicious, so what you got going on? Yeah. We're, we're watching you, big brother, oh, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then all of a sudden your entire digital and physical presence is tracked backward to what you might be feeling guilty about in the moment. <laughs> yes. To a degree, we can do that now, yes. <laughs> yes, but the subliminal reaction for facial reconstruction, I think, was a neat idea mm -hmm. used in this uh, case, even if it wasn't portrayed terribly well. You pointed that out. Yeah. Uh, I also point out that, you know, it, it runs through all these images and then it just happens, to, it stops. And, oh, that's him, like, so was that image in there before, and now it's saying, okay, this is the one you reacted to? Uh, or? The, the subliminal thing was picking on it. It just set, stopped, and she then said what happened in the right. moment. I am actually going to give them just a little bit on, on that, because they explained that it was measuring her, so if it might sense when she knows to stop before she even knows to say stop. <laughs> There was uh, one thing in this that is in almost every 80s and 90s when they try to predict the future is the idea of the video phone. Yeah. Not, not, not a smartphone. You're not FaceTiming. No, no. This is a phone with a video screen mm -hmm. on, <laughs> on the desk. Well, that's because in 1996, they could actually get a hold of one of those. Because <laughs> it already was a thing. It just was crap yeah. then. It never became a thing because no, it was No, no. Never caught on. I, well, and it misses the point of what you want to do in a conversation. It, it, it suggested that the face-to-face -face was the more th important thing rather than understanding. It's the being able to have the conversation on the go anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's the part that the video phone missed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you don't want to sit there at, at your home staring at the... <laughs> well, yeah, because by the time video phones are becoming a thing, at least cordless phones are a thing. So 
you you're catching you you've missed the beha- the human behavior. As soon as the phone got cordless, lots of calls started happening a lot more often because you could be up and moving, doing stuff. And if all of a sudden now to have the conversation, I got to stand in front of the little three by three screen to watch. Yeah. No. <laughs> A real minor thing. There was one point where he's uh, needs access to some files, so he he holds up his uh, his black shield mm-hmm. to the screen, and I my first thought was like, is that like an RFID tag? At early thoughts, yeah. In fact, actually, having worked on some um, government and um, military style uh, equipment as far as computers, uh, they they were they've been using them forever. The slot where you literally enter in your your key that allows you to have access. So that was mm-hmm. just in a visual version of the same idea. Yeah. So yeah. very and, and nailed it. Uh, yeah, you can do that stuff. I think about anyone's badge that you just pass over something. Exactly. It's the same deal. Touch screens, which the technology has been around, you know, it, that predates this film, but it's not something that many people were familiar with. No, and it wasn't ubiquitous. Uh, no, absolutely not. So not projecting like that 2009, you could touch almost any screen, that's pretty close to true. Yeah. Uh, a few things that uh, didn't happen. Uh, we don't have laser fencing. No, no. <laughs> and man, wouldn't that come in handy? <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Vaporize no, no. your neighbor's dog. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I loved it that, you know, the crime scene, instead of yellow tape, they actually set up a laser screen <laughs> that he has to deactivate in order yeah, to pass that, through. Yeah, because that means the thing was would damage you if you had gone through it. Instead of some of them, uh, I've always loved the, the movies or series where the yellow tape has been changed to just a hologram that gets projected in an immediate area. Right. Why they didn't go with that, I don't know. <laughs> And apparently the uh, strip mall laser surgery, I don't think has quite uh, caught on yet. <laughs> I don't know. You could get LASIK in the mall. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, if it, you just it, yeah, if uh, the office could be anywhere and it doesn't take up a lot of space, so so yeah. Uh, while maybe we're not doing it quite to that degree, we're, it's not an entire miss. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll give that we'll give that half points maybe. Half points. Uh, the, the part they missed is the fact that there would be a mall. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those are all the ones that uh, jumped out at me. Was there anything else that anything I missed? Anything you picked up on? Uh, well, I, I, well, one of the things uh, I don't know, pro or con. I, I thought it funny we had laser fence, but they didn't have laser guns. There was no, if in fact, if anything, that that was one of the things I just wanted to talk about out of fun. When we get to the end of the movie and and Detective Cameron is suiting up and, and, and carrying all these, one he seemed like he was completely inept with every weapon that he had at, in his arsenal, and then what the hell was that giant metal bib he was wearing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what that was for. And I think what's c- c- really funny is not only was he inept with whatever weapon he was using, none of it comes to any kind of fruition. No. No. It, she's the one that saves the day <laughs> yeah. with just shit she had lying around. <laughs> it, it, if anything, that was actually one of my more enjoyable moments in the film. And actually, not bad for 1996. Uh, um, that the woman saved the day. The, the the woman saves the woman saves the day of the big dude. I mean, Roddy was a wrestler, um, yeah. and still had a lot of that build with him. And yet, the little girl is the one that saves him from the bad guy. That that was actually really cool. I'll yeah, give absolutely. It, I'll it was. give it credit for that. I just love the fact that our hero, if it had been truly up to him, Earth is doomed. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. <laughs> No, in fact, uh, it starts begging the question, how exactly did you get that black badge? (laughs) Clearly wasn't for weapons proficiency. (laughs) Well, I'm guessing this is the first alien virus that he had to go up against. 
Yeah, but he's still a cop. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a very special one. I would like to think he might be able to handle a rifle without fumbling it around everywhere. I mean, but to get back to the the question about, uh, no, I don't have anything to add because, again, this is one of those deals where they had a world that they needed to expand on, as we've been discussing. But, again, low budget, I get. Uh, but, yeah, they didn't really think through how that world should fully look. So that's why we're always tight and really creepy, dark spaces. Mm. I mean, yeah, it goes with the vibe of what they're trying to do. But it also means we don't have to show you anything we didn't think through. All right. Well, we did not get any... Uh... Uh, uh, social media comments. I, I feel like maybe this movie went under the radar. <laughs> maybe just a bit, because uh, on the other side of things, on the professional side, there is also nothing. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I searched wikis. I searched uh, Metacritic. Uh, <laughs> the just standard Google. I went on to any of the known reviewers that I know. Nobody touched this thing. Did it even go to the theater? Yeah, that I do not know. This may have been a, let's see, 96. Okay. Yeah, it may have been direct-to-video. Yeah, it, it's got that vibe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, nothing wrong with that vibe, but that means there's not a whole lot of critical uh, review. Well, then I guess that will probably do it for Sci Fighters from 1996. I, I give it a moderate recommendation like i said i think two and a half stars is a fair you know out of five i think is is a is a fair assessment for this film tom i maybe would take a star off <laughs> yeah I, i'd probably take a star off but here as with anything it it was a it was fun to watch it once i don't know that you could pay me to watch it again <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I would uh, go back and watch this anytime. Certainly not anytime soon. Uh, like I said, once I started watching it, I realized, oh, I've seen this before. But it was probably years ago. We we can uh, revisit this one for my 20th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> By then, we'll have completely forgotten that this ever existed. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we will come back in another couple weeks. We're, next time, we're going to talk about 2005's The Island with Ewan McGregor and... Um, Scarlett Johansson. I remember watching this one, again, a long time ago. Uh, I seem to remember thinking it was pretty decent. So hopefully it'll be a, a better uh, experience than Sci Fighters. Yes, no, and I, I can say... Uh, I have seen this movie at least probably four or five times. So, Oh, really? Oh, quite a few. Okay, I know I've only seen it the one time. It, I it's think. one of those that it, it can be comfort food. Uh, I, I can sit and just have it on. And in case anyone is curious, I believe this film, as I said, was from 2005, and it predicts 2019. So we'll see what they think 2019 should have been like. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Yes, definitely. So any thoughts on The Island, or if you happen to go and watch Sci Fighters, or if you've seen that film, please drop us an email, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to all the social media sites and leave your comments there. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. See ya.